And it's not necessarily saying that, you know, all is great in China. It's not. It's, it's a very challenging environment over there. But we are saying that large American businesses are, are in China. We have successes. We have failures. But we're there to stay. I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by my old friend, Kurt Gibbs. He has recently authored, or edited, I should say, a book called Selling to China, Stories of Success, Failure, and Constant Change. If you don't know Kerr, you haven't been dealing with China much in the last 20 years. He's been there for 20 years in many different hats as a consultant, an investment banker, an investor, and probably, I guess, the best known as president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. Um, so this is a it's a it's a book which really is on the ground. All of the authors have worked in China. They've really uh, in addition to you and, and uh, Ken Jarrett, who write both a forward and then an epilogue, um, everybody there has spent enormous amounts of time. But the introduction talks, you talk about why you've written the book, but give the, the listeners and the watchers a sense of why you edited this book. Sure. Thanks, Steve. And it's great to be with you here to, to talk about the book and, you know, kind of what's going on in China. But the, the reason we wrote the book is, uh, and this is a very important point, is we, we felt that the, the conversation, the dialogue about China has just become so dominated by the national security issues and the territorial disputes. And we really felt that the, the commercial discussion was getting lost. And, and we felt it was important to bring that back into the conversation so that people can be reminded of, of, of why this relationship with China is so important and we've got to get these problems solved so that, so that we can get it back on track. So that's that's kind of the why part of, of, of why we wrote the book. Um, but what, what people will think, what readers would get out of this is the book itself is, it, it's not really a book about US-China relations per se, although that's obviously the backdrop for, for everything we write about. But what this is, book is, is, is really a window into the world of, of large foreign businesses and how they operate in China, what issues we deal with, uh, what struggles we face, and, and what, what successes and failures we've, we've experienced over, over the years. So that's in a nutshell what, what the book was about. How did you choose each of the chapters? I mean, what, when I often talk about kind of big companies in China and, the, you know, everybody focuses on the problems, the IP theft, few focus on the successes. But I think about Starbucks, McDonald's, now owned by my former partners, KFC, Apple, some, you know, Sheraton, Hilton, those guys who've had really great successes. But you choose others. Why? Well, well, I was, I was really going for a cross section, and I was going for diversity. So each chapter is is representing a, a different industry, and I did not pick authors or industries that are particular successes or particular failures. You're going to find both in in this book, but I wanted it. It is also a a slice of China business. It's very specific. It's it's large foreign businesses, so it, it is not about you know, lots of exciting stories about Chinese entrepreneurs and also stories about, you know, the state-owned enterprises and things like that. All of those things are part of the fabric of, of, of business in China, but this is just the large foreign businesses. So that's that's how I how I chose the, the authors. Um, I was also going for diversity in the sense that I picked a few authors that are China born and, and some authors that are not China born. So this is a, a story about foreign business, but it's not necessarily written by foreigners. Because as you know, Steve, you know, the process of localization has, has really taken place in many of our businesses, really middle management all the way up to the top are now are now run by by Chinese nationals. And what we find is that some of them actually deal with similar concepts in the book in slightly different ways. For example, I mean, every book, of, every business book on China, I mean, has to deal with, this, you know, Guanxi and Mianzi and, you know, these kinds of things. But 
but they're dealt with in a slightly different way by the authors that are China born versus versus some of the foreigners. So that's basically how I how I selected uh, the authors. The book, I mean, it's fair to say that the book is advocating continuing to invest in China, even though it points out some of the failures, the difficulties and stuff. Have have people said you're too soft on China? Has that been a criticism? Well, I mean, I think I think there's there's always going to be people out there that kind of miss the nuance of our relationship with China. And that, and that in a sense, that really is what the book is about, is trying to bring nuance into the conversation. There's there's going to be people out there who just read the headlines and and look at the national security issues of which there are many. And, and serious issues, and they're saying, "Well, why are we even there? You know, we should we should disconnect from China." And and you're right, Steve. I mean, this is this is very much a a pro engagement book. Uh, it's not necessarily a pro China book, and it's not necessarily saying that you know all is great in China. It's not. It's it's a very challenging environment over there. But we are saying that large American businesses are are in China. We have successes. We have failures. But we're there to stay. It's a, it's, it's still a, a, a very attractive, and it's in some industries a must-have market. And in some of the chapters, the the authors go into some detail about why it is absolutely critical that American companies are are in China and stay in China. For example, in the automotive section, I don't want to steal any of the thunder that Bill Russo has has written about, but he's. The automotive in particular, I mean, not just Tesla, but but all of the, the, the large American companies that are selling autos. I mean, China is the largest auto market in the world. And Bill Russo makes the argument that it probably always will be. And so we need to be there not just to make revenue and profit, but to 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 experience the the innovation that, that's happening, especially as we as we see this this shift from from what we call ICE over to NEV, so the internal combustion engines over to new energy vehicles. So he makes a very compelling argument about that. Yeah, I, I think the automotive chapter is, I'm, all the chapters are great. That one is particularly great. What's interesting, what I kind of wanted him to make a contrast to, but he didn't, uh, was to Japan. Mm. So I walk the streets of Shanghai and I see GMs and I see, yeah, I see Fords, I see Chryslers, I see now Teslas. I didn't years ago, obviously. When you walk the streets of Tokyo, you don't see that. And nobody bothers to point out that contrast. You know, it's funny you should say that, Steve. Um, our good friend, Bob Feline, who's the, the late yes. Bob, that passed away a few years ago, we dedicated the book to him. One of the things he used to point out is exactly what you just said. He says, you know, it's funny how, you know, GM, you know, it, it it's always in the news talking about you know issues in China and you know and 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 people like you said you know they talk about um, you know some of the problems that happen in China and, and he pointed out that gee it's funny you know GM never complains about the market in Japan and it's because they don't sell any cars there <laughs> and it's it's just not a not an open market for 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 American vehicles and I agree with you I mean walking around downtown Tokyo, you just, just look up and see what brands you see, and you're not going to really see the the American brands there. And and you walk down, and as you said, you know, walk down Nanjing Road and, and some of the shopping areas in China, and you see you see foreign brands everywhere. And and again, our good friend Bob Vlin used to make that point that China, yes, we do complain about market access. Yes, there are issues. Um, it, it, the USTR is not wrong to be to be pushing for that, but it's also true that the China may actually be the, the the best success story in Asia for for American products. Yeah, yeah, it's it's such it's such an inter it's so understated. When you're in Washington and you point that out, people say, "Oh, well, you're apologizing." No, we're not apologizing. We're just stating a fact. You know, I spent plenty of time in Tokyo, so I understand that. Um, in, in chapter one, you know, Don and Murray Williams write, in recent years, while IPR continues to be an issue, the bigger story is innovate, innovation and intellectual property creation. Do you agree with that statement? Is IPR no longer, you know, kind of fading away as an issue? Yeah, you know what, Steve? The thing is, 
I think this is a very good example of how multiple things can be true at the same time. And it, it is true that, that in the early days after Deng Xiaoping moved China towards this, this reform and opening up and, and they set that goal you know, to really catch up economically with the rest of the world, I'd be for, yeah, they, they were on a mission to catch up and really didn't care much how they got there. And, you know, I would, I would respectfully point out that that's not that dissimilar with what the United States as a young country breaking free from Britain and Alexander Hamilton. I mean, he was, he was famous for that. He said, he, he said the same thing. We got to, we got to develop our, our, our new country and do it any way we can. And, and American entrepreneurs in those days stole IP shamelessly from the, 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 the textile mills in, in Britain and moved technology over to, to the new world. Now, I, I don't want to get into what about ism and, and certainly not with a story that's 300 years old. But the point here is, is, that, um, is that that was true uh, to large extent, but it, the, the market has really shifted. And I would say around 2015 is when the IP courts really developed. And, and second, and Don Williams makes this point in his chapter about how China has been developing its, its own IP and so had more of an incentive to, 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 to protect it and to set down the infrastructure and, and system to, to protect IP. Now, that is not to say it's not an issue and that theft doesn't take place. It does. But it's a very dis different situation today than it was before. And again, this is one of the reasons why we wrote the book is we want people to have an updated and nuanced understanding of the current situation in China with, with respect to how our businesses are operating there. Yep. Um, Jean Liu, and I, this jumped out at me, writes, uh, there's an established process for the passage of new laws. In fact, this process can be long and democratic. Um, and what talking about here is is consulting with affected industries and China does have uh, a decent policy on that but if there if it's a political issue if there touches on any political issue isn't that not true and there isn't consultation one thinks most immediately of laws relating to Hong Kong there wasn't real consultation again multiple things being true at the same time and she's right it's it, it one is is it's a very important chapter that 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 everybody who reads the book really should maybe start with that one it's this relationship with the government and how the government works i mean let's face it, it china is a very different political and economic system and always will be but uh so you're right i mean and and you use the d word there democratic and a lot of people will have a reaction to that and say no china is not democratic in, the, in respect to, to passing of certain laws, they actually do. And they, they do go into the business community, foreign business community, and actively solicit input from the community. And this is a big part of what the American Chamber of Commerce does, is we consolidate that input from actual mm -hmm. business practitioners. And get, now, do they listen? <sighs> Not always, and it, and it depends. And, and But there's a couple of things you gave one example in the case of Hong Kong, but there's other there's other cases where the the tax treat the personal income tax treatment of foreigners that that they had made a decision some five or six years ago to make a big change in how foreigners are taxed in China. The foreign community over there went ballistic and has been been actively engaged with the government there to try and get them to change or delay that. They have. So, so it does work, um, but you're right. In in certain contexts, it works. You're also right. Um, transparency is an issue, and and transparency, consistency, trying to interpret the regulations. And again, yes, yeah, that's one of the things that that Jean Liu is 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 explaining in her chapter about that. That foreign business people really need to to understand that and. This is one of the issues that, that's been raised in the last few days as Secretary of Commerce uh, Raimundo has been over there in China talking to the, the foreign business community. And this is one of the issues that's been raised is general transparency and specifically around China's uh, data protection law. And foreign companies are having a real struggle 
um, understanding it, making sure that they are in compliance with it. And in some cases, they're going to have to adjust business practices to accommodate it. You think the setting, since you mentioned Secretary Raimondo's visit, do you think the working groups that she's going to, that she is setting up with the Chinese MOFCOM is going to help at least establish some understanding of the new rules, both for U.S. businesses in China and for Chinese businesses in the U.S.? Um, too early to say what the what the results of that are going to be, but a very positive move that the that the two governments at least can agree on something, and that and that there's a positive dialogue and and a process being put in place, and more importantly, I think the the visits from both both Treasury Secretary Yellen and Secretary of Commerce Raimundo, I mean, I, I think have. Have have managed to kind of stop the slide of 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 downward movement in the relationship, and so we are we're definitely hopeful that that this can lead to just more constructive engagement at the gov to gov level. Mm -hmm. Gene, of course, was experienced the the wiping out of the tutoring, the private tutoring industry. She, I think, was part of that industry. And that was not consultative. It happened overnight and suddenly, you know, 90% of the market value of those companies was wiped out. This is something that that concerns all of us, not just the foreign companies, but the domestic. I mean, in fact, I think the domestic companies probably the took effect. better hit yeah. than, than the foreign ones. And you're right, it, it happened suddenly. Um, and this is something that's that's concerning, again, to both communities, is that the suddenness and lack of transparency and, you know, where is this all headed? Um, because it's it's not just the it's not just the the education sector that that experienced that sudden shift. But then it was also the, in the technology sector when they decided to kind of rein in the tech sector that happened very suddenly now. You know, from the bankers like yourself and, and, and myself, we've, we've kind of been expecting some kind of uh, movement in the tech sector for quite a long time because the tech sector has actually been given uh, quite a lot of leeway. And I'm talking going back, you know, 15 years or more in yeah. terms of capital raising and, and the, the latitude that, that the tech, which I think the Chinese government, I think, should be given credit for for staying out of the way for as long as they have, you know, to let that tech sector develop, which it has. But the sudden uh, action to, to rein it in, I think shocked people. And, and now we're seeing something possibly similar in, in, in healthcare. Um, that, that hard to say whether that's, that's purely a, you know, a anti-corruption move or whether it's more to, to get more control over health, healthcare, hard to say. So, but those are, those are, some of the things that that concern all of us and and again at foreign companies and domestic companies alike yeah i mean it raises the question how much of the problem is based upon being a foreign business and how much is the problem is based upon being a private business whether foreign or not exactly uh, and, and a lot of these um so-called foreign businesses actually operate very much like like local businesses but then, you know, then at some point you you still run into regulation, and and then there's um, and as you as you brought up earlier, the the interpretation of those regulations and how does it affect me? And and I think this is one of the points that we bring up in the book is that very often the signs are there, you just have to to know how to read them, and and again, China is a very different place. And, and again, this is one of the reasons why we, we wrote the book. We, we just want practitioners to, to get the benefit of, of those lessons. We've been over there for quite a long time and, and learned a few things. So um, it, it can be very, very different from what it was before. Very, very different from what it was before. And, and, but, but continuing to evolve you know, on a daily basis. So you really have to, to, to keep track of it. Yeah. Yeah, you and I have lived through lots of pendulum swings. Indeed. So I, I can remember in the 80s when things would change, people would become depressed and say, we need to leave. And, you know, then the pendulum would swing back. And if you'd left, you would have lost your market share and not be able to succeed. And in the 90s, same thing happened. Um, so it's my guess is 
we're in another pendulum swing and it will swing back. And I think China noise that the government, the Chinese government is making on foreign investment now is actually becoming more positive. Is that true? I mean, no, you were I, just in China. I, I was, I just came back uh, two days ago. Uh, I spent most of the summer in Shanghai uh, launching the book and, and talking to people about, about the current business environment. And I think you're exactly right, Steve. We are in a pendulum. Um, although unlike a pendulum where you pretty much can see what the track is, this pendulum moves in odd directions sometimes, difficult to predict. Um, but as far as exiting the, the market, you're exactly right. It, it's a hard market to go back into if you if you abandon your position. And so I, I don't see many foreign companies at all abandoning the company as a uh, abandoning China as a market. I am seeing them restructure, and you know it's very fashionable to talk about de-risking these days. But 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 it there is a process by which um, some of the larger companies are kind of separating their China business from the rest of the world, and this is concerning. And it, it, it and it's happening as a result of, of of a lot of different factors. One of which is lessons that came out of COVID, but but and and part of it also is the U.S. driven so-called decoupling measures and security measures, it's also coming from the China side. And, and this is something that I've raised often with the Chinese government is, let's not pretend that it's only the US driving decoupling. It's, you know, China's doing the same thing. And this data protection law is one example. And it's the data protection law makes it very difficult for multinational companies to operate in the way that they're accustomed to, meaning, operating across borders where all of their operations touch multiple countries. And that's an issue when it becomes illegal to move data outside of China. So that is gonna be driving decoupling from a production point of view. Yeah, I, I, no question. As recently as this morning, I was on a Zoom, a track to Zoom with the Chinese. And, we were talking and they said, well, the, the, the technology decoupling has been driven by the United States. And I just went, it neither is true historically, nor is it true presently. I said, historically, if we start in 2009, 2010 with Facebook and Google, um, you know, being effectively ejected from China and then YouTube and Twitter and da, 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 da. Um, and then with the data protection law, today they the, the chinese didn't accept the argument interestingly they, interesting. they yeah. you know steve I'm, I'm glad you're raising this in these track two dialogues that that you and the the committee are are, are so involved in I, I i had the same reaction i just read um ambassador xie Feng wrote a very interesting article in the washington post um and he made that point. He he was saying, you know, the united states should should not be separating. I can't quite quote him uh, verbatim, but uh, I think you probably know the op-ed that, that I'm talking about. And, you know, I looked at it and again, respectfully, we've had a lot of very productive meetings with, with Ambassador Xie Feng, um, especially when he was coming up through the, the foreign ministry. I've met him several times and we've raised that with respect. Uh, look who started it. I mean, what's, what's the great firewall if it's, and now this data protection law, if it's not um, separating the, the economies. I mean, they've done a very effective job of completely isolating the digital economy in China. And, and the question now is, is that the model going forward that industry after industry is also going to be isolated like that? Um, um, or, or are we going to find a way to, to get back together and, 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 um, enable the efficiencies that come with global companies, both right. from the United States and from China. I mean, today there's there are global companies coming out of China and they want the same things we do, which is the efficiencies that come from running a multinational company, not, not a company that operates in, in multiple nations, but, but operating across borders. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it's uh, what I think people need to talk about is we can make the decision that we want to separate, but we need to understand the consequences of that and precisely what you're, you've said, that the cost that that 
uh, creates for any company is just enormous. And ultimately, Americans and Chinese, average American and Chinese pay the price for that. Um, it's the, uh, the, the chapter on the automotive sector, again, addresses some of these issues. It's great, but, you know, it's a great chapter. What, how much do we know, have people calculated how much the tariffs and the dislocation and the supply change in the automotive sector have increased prices for American autos? That's a great I was, question. I was told it's thousands of dollars. Oh, it, it, undoubtedly, the, the American consumer is, is 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 suffering the consequences, and I think Treasury Secretary Yellen has has made this point repeatedly. Um, and uh, no, there's no question that that the American consumer has 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 paid that price. Um, but having said that, you know, business business finds a way, business adjusts, and so you know, life goes on. We you know we we did suffer during the during. The, the in the throes of the trade war and you know in some ways it's it, it's still going on um but uh you know hopefully we can find a way to get back together um and and and, and resolve these differences you know? yeah i mean the argument that i often make is that the uh the increase in cost that it has created this is for americans in other words the argument that you make to folks who say well the u.s this doesn't affect us you know the chinese pay these tariffs you know, retailers tell you that the average bill for a uh, an American family of four has gone up about a thousand U.S. dollars. So if you're wealthy, it's kind of whatever. You don't notice a thousand dollars. If you're lower income, you got to decide, do I buy the kids new shoes? Do I buy them textbooks? Do I buy them shirts? What, you know, what do I decide to buy? That there's a real con consequence for the uh, lower a worse consequence for lower income americans and absolutely, absolutely right steve and and you know i was just in nebraska uh, a few months ago and and it, you're right it's not just the 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 low end consumers who are you know people shopping in, in walmart and stores like that but the farmers i mean they hate the tariffs i mean they're just pointing to rows of corn and saying you know i'm not selling as much corn and it's not the price that i want and and it's it's because of the tariffs and yeah. it's it's ironic actually you know they you know, you go to Nebraska, I mean, it's deep red, obviously. And, you know, they, they're going to vote Republican. They love President Trump. They hate the tariffs. And and they kind of blame, uh, they blame President Biden for not dropping the tariffs that, that President Trump actually put in place. And so it's, it's, it's actually ironic, I think, in the next election cycle, it's very likely that President Biden is going to be punished for the sins of Trump. And so if that's, if that's not iron. Well, he should have he cut the tariffs, though. I agree with the farmers. He should have cut the tariffs. The tariffs. So um, th there's a great chapter on the on sports marketing with a with a discussion of the NBA. What are the lessons that we should take from both the NBA's mm -hmm. success in China, which has been enormous, and the challenges that it's faced? It has been a great success in, in in China, and it's 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 sad to see what happened there. Um, I'm sure all your listeners are familiar with the with the story of the, the Daryl Morey tweet and the consequences of it. Um, so we don't need to go through all those details here. But but you're right. I mean, the NBA was a great a great brand and a great ambassador for 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 the United States. It's you know the the, the game of basketball, which which the Chinese love. Um, so it was really um, an unfortunate situation all around. I think we take a couple of different lessons. I mean, one is the larger geopolitical lesson, and, and that is that the reality is, you know, China, China is 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 kind of unique in this in this way, is that they're so sensitive to this. And uh, geopolitics is going to enter into the business realm, whether we like it or not. They this is the way China is. They have these knee-jerk reactions to these things. They're very sensitive, very um, and they, they they react to these things, and so companies that operate in that in that market are just going to have to understand that as a reality. Um, the other lesson, I think, um, and Mark Fisher does a great job kind of explaining this and and um, going into how to resolve problems when they do arise. And this, I think, China is it may not be unique in this respect. Is that when these things happen you can't really uh, litigate everything in the media. Um, yes, you do need to make public statements, but you also need to, to have the face-to-face -face meetings quickly. And Adam Silver did that, um, but, but probably not 
as quickly as he as, as he could have. Um, I mean, I wasn't that close to it myself. Um, so I was watching it in the media um, uh, myself, but it, it probably could have been handled better. Um, the uh, and the results, of course, you know, to to be, I guess, the NBA was kept out of China for practically almost two years, and so a lot of businesses lost lost a lot of a lot of revenues um, from as a result of. But it's that. now it's kind of resorted to the old model. It's back. It's you know all is forgiven. Time heals all wounds, I suppose, and you know off we go. But but until the next time. Um, Look, it's still a great brand. It's still a great representative kind of American culture and and um, sports. And my hope is we'll see another Yao Ming in the, in the NBA. We'll see another great Chinese player in the U.S. NBA. I'm, I'm quite sure we will. And if not in the NBA, some other sport. And again, the, the sports is, is the great equalizer, or it should be. And it should be that thing that kind of brings everybody together, you know, at that, the people to people level. This has given the listener uh, a flavor of what is in this book. Read it for an on the ground perspective, one which gives you sufficient nuance to kind of understand what's going on in the commercial relationship between the United States and China. Kurt, thank you for what you do, what you've done, what you do to promote US-China commercial relations, uh, your work at the Shanghai, at the American Chamber in Shanghai, and for editing this wonderful book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. It's been great to be with you.